Good morning. What we've been uh, tasked with or for this discussion is uh, the Alberta advantage has disappeared. And the question is, why has it disappeared and what are we going to do about it? Let me start from my personal experience. This kind of thing is and has happened to me for the third time in my lifetime. I started uh, in 1970 as uh, the head of finance for a major consulting company. I got a promotion, but my paycheck became smaller. And that was in the 70s, a remnant of the Harold Wilson and James Callaghan government in the UK. And I decided, since I was still very young, that uh, lured by uh, the success of Alberta, and those were the days of the blue-eyed cheeks, I decided to take a position and came to Calgary. At the time, we had some uh, absolutely incredible times in the oil patch where the revenues in Alberta were growing up, gushing out of the ground. And fortunately, at the time, we had a visionary premier in Peter Lockheed. The problem is, in my view, the problem started right there. And it started sometimes in the 30s when the conservatives be decided to become progressive conservatives to revive themselves. And Peter Lockheed came in and called the party the Progressive Conservative Party of Alberta. And the problems that we have today, in my view, is that we have a growing problem. And it's not only Alberta, it's not only Canada. There has been a total change in the meaning of the word progressive. In my view, today's definition of progressive has got nothing to do with progress. It has all to do with socialism and political correctness. And to me, the Alberta advantage, in my view, started disappearing because what we have today is more progressiveness in ideology. And it's not only political ideology, but in ideology in cultural uh, areas. So let's have a look at the past. We are the Lockheed growth years. We build the Heritage Fund. I want to m emphasize the Heritage Fund here. The idea was great. But it's the policies on how to manage it and where the money went from the interest that came from the Heritage Fund and how it was being, being used. Then we had the Klein years. But as John said earlier, the Klein years were great. But it was not the sort of small government conservatism that we were looking for. He created the Alberta Advantage. He did a number of things, as John stated earlier. I won't repeat them, but they worked. We had no debt and lower taxes. But what has happened today is we've moved from the good to the bad. We had the National Energy Program. That's the second time that get. When I came to Canada, that's the second time I got the whammy. I came here to look for growth, economic advantage, and I came right here in the 80s. Boom! We have the Na National Energy Program. Then we had the Don Getty days in Alberta. These were not very good days because, in my view, the only thing that Getty did was the family day. From an economic point of view, there was nothing good about the Getty days. The not-so-conservative Stelmach government. Stelmach was part of the so-called Deep Six group. 
very conservative. When he was on a backbench uh, as, as a member, he used to be very critical of what was going on and how we were spending. But once he got into power, it changed completely. He thought that because we had revenues, it was time to distribute the revenues. But how do we distribute it was, as you said, John, an increase in programs. Not a review of programs, but an increase in program spending. Then we had the disastrous progressive Red Redford leadership. As you mentioned, she wanted change. How can you be a leader of a conservative party who had been in power for so many years and you want to change it? Change it to what? The problem is, once again, progressiveness. That's the problem that we have today, in my view. Then we had the not-so-bright Prentice budget. During the days of the Red Ford days, I was invited to take part in one of the uh, committees called the Budget Review Committee. I spent two years with a number of people on that committee. There were a number of good things that were put forward. Then a government collapsed and Prentice came in. And my friend Rick McIver at the time, who I advised for 15 years when he was a counselor uh, on, the, on the Calgary Council, I told him, I said, Rick, this budget is not going to work. My contacts in England predict an oil price below 50 for the next 10 years. At the time, most people didn't know why that was going to happen. There are so many global changes in the oil industry. There is the environmental movement that has pushed every thinking on oil in a totally different way. Now, whether it's progressiveness or not, I will leave that to other people to decide. But there is an agenda from the environmentalists that we should not be using oil at all. The problem that I have today is that governments who are spineless are adopting some of those environmental thinking and destroying what we already have as an energy source, as opposed to say, OK, the energy source is here. We will use it. And then we will also look for alternative, but not cut it and put alternatives immediately. To do so, what do we have to do is to finance the alternative ones. When people start talking about alternative energy, most people, the ordinary citizens, doesn't understand that most of the alternative energy that we are going to use today is heavily subsidized. Elon Musk, the great inventor and innovator, stepped down from the Trump Committee on Energy because he moved out of the climate change protocol of Paris. But what most people don't understand is the left loves it because there's Elon Musk, the creator of the electric car, the man who's putting out, going to go to, to Mars, has said that he cannot agree with Trump on the Paris Agreement. So to them, it was a great thing that happened. But most people don't understand that his industry of the electric car is heavily subsidized. And when you talk about heavy subsidized, where do you think the money comes from? You and me, the taxpayer. To continue, you have the great government of Ontario who gives subsidies to purchasers of electric cars. So an electric car nowadays is mostly virtually above, above $65,000 for the for the good ones. So in Ontario, they will give you a subsidy and to incentivize you to buy an electric car. So where do you think the money comes from? 
But there's the progressive thinking here. If you make $100,000, you have the amount of money to pay and buy an electric car, which is more expensive than an ordinary car. We will give you some money. These are the same people who say to you that we've got to look after the middle class. But most people in the middle class cannot afford an electric car unless it is subsidized. And the subsidy will come from taxes. What happens is now we have what I call a triple threat. We have a liberal government in Ottawa. We have an NDP government in Alberta. And the latest one is a NDP government in BC. And those three together are going to start a war on oil. Trudeau, in my view, is just going to dance around on a pinhead like fairies, you know? He's going to say, oh, this is the regulation, or we're going to put more regulation. The Kinder Morgan pipeline cannot be done. We need more reviews. Uh, going to invite more uh, indigenous groups to come in, more environmental groups to review the Kinder Morgan, and so on and so forth. The NDP in BC are saying, absolutely not. So what are the results of all this? Let's say the price of oil goes up in Alberta. So automatically we think that our revenues are going to go up. But if you don't have a way to distribute what you're taking out of the ground, you're not going to get revenues. And the problem we have today is that progressive are saying, you must not take it out of the ground. But what they forget is that we are still going to be dependent on oil for the next 50 to 60 years. We cannot go and straight away go to alternative sources of energy. The funny part about source alternative sources of energy is that, once again, it is heavily subsidized. There are certain local governments who are talking about, we are going to put stations for plugging your car. Well, where is going the, the electricity going to come from? Is it going to be all sourced by alternative energy? The other thing that you've got to look at is, if the government start putting stations for you to plug in your car, it becomes a monopoly. Once again, government will control how it is distributed. And that is not the way that we should be going on when we start talking about small government. And this is where we are losing our principles. The ugly in Alberta. Let's look at some of those numbers. 2016-2017 deficit, 260 million higher than budgeted higher than budgeted. 2016, 2016, 2017 expenses, 53.2 billion. That's 1.9 billion more than expected. The deficit was 10.8 billion. The Alberta debt is now 33.3 billion. The so-called carbon tax that is going to make us more environmentally responsible will bring in 3.9 billion. There's the, there's the rub that I have about this. Some people may say that a carbon tax is a good thing because it will change our way of thinking about energy, about the environment. How do we use that money? What are we doing with that 3.9 million? It is going to people who want to change the way they are doing things. But it's not really true. It's going into programs that are being passed on to my little friends down the road. More regulations like Bill C-6 affecting farmers. 
Now, we are talking about how great we are doing. We are getting back up on the road to, to getting our stuff and our economy back on, on track. Unfortunately, Alberta is still 8% unemployment. 41,900 of the 48,500 jobs created were in the public sector. It's always in the public sector. In the meantime, we put regulations that are crippling small businesses. When I talk about the tri triple threat, look at what has happened now. Mono and Trudeau wants to start looking at those rich people who are professionals, doctors, accountants, because they are skimming the system. They are not paying their fair share, right? Their fair share. The question is, if you ask somebody in politics, what is a fair share? Nobody has got a number for you. What is a fair share percentage of tax that should be paid by somebody? Nobody can tell you. They just increase it in, in, incrementally, and we just go up and go up and go up. Corporate taxes increase from 10 to 12 percent in Alberta, right? They plan to increase the minimum wage $15 an hour. From an economic point of view, always changing the level of minimum wage does not help in the initial stage ever. In fact, for those same enlightened people who talk about increasing the way that people live today by putting a $15 as opposed to a lower minimum wage, what is going to happen is technology is going to change everything. Intelligent, artificial intelligence is beginning to come in and come in and use in corporations today. Has anybody heard about the latest deal between Domino Pizza and Ford? Well, who delivers your pizza? Some little guy comes in in a car and delivers it. Is he on $15 a, an hour wage? I mean, this is a sort of entry level jobs that are going to be affected. Well, Ford has entered into an agreement with Domino Pizzas in the States. They're going to build a driverless car. And the driverless car has no back seat. The back seat is going to be equipped with a warmer and a cooler. So you will order your stuff and your pizza comes in. You will be given a four digit number and you will be tracking your pizza coming to your place, comes into your front door, bing, 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 your four numbers, you open it, go to the back seat and you pull up your pizza. 15 minimum wage, who loses the job here? Who gains it? Ford and Domino's. Not the little guy. The little guy is gone. He's got no job now. The result of all this ug ugliness, the credit rating of Alberta is no longer a double A. It used to be a triple A. Now it's an A plus. Right? So no more Alberta advantage. It's mostly like the Alberta disadvantage. Cutting 7 billion out of 55 billion will be really tough. It is not going to be tough because we can't make the right decisions. It's because our politicians are not willing to make the tough decisions. Once they get, they promise you a lot of things before they get elected. Once they get elected, two things happen. One, they face reality because when they open the books, they see something else. Or two, they are thinking about the next election. Why should I be put under jeopardy by doing the things that I have said? Because I can't do it. I won't get reelected. 
Focus on lower taxes is one way of doing things. But just cutting taxes is not going to do it. Cut deficits and lower debt levels. That's what politicians tell you they are going to do. But is it something that we can do, you know, at the drop of a hat? In my view, implementing zero-based budgeting is one way of looking at it. We've got to start somewhere. I don't have all the answers, but to me that's one way of looking at it is zero-based budgeting. We've got, it is not the programs that are a problem. It's the delivery and the cost of delivery of programs and the number of programs that are a problem in government. Every government that comes in has got a new idea for a new program, but very little about changing the programs, existing programs, or cutting them back. The promotion of public-private partnership is one way of looking at things. But do we have enough of it? Should we move forward to get more public-private partnerships to, to be done? We need health care reform. Health care is supposedly a provincial responsibility. But governments just go and get money from the federal government, as you said, who dictates to us what we are going to do. If you don't do what I say, you won't get the money. So therefore, we are spending 40% of our budget on health care, but truly speaking, we don't have any control on how it is being delivered. I have, I have a, a, a set of numbers here by uh, the Fraser Institute. They found that 63,459 persons left the country for medical care in 2016. This is up by 40%. Was that from Alberta or Canada? Canada, right? That's why I say, we always talk about the delivery is provincial, but the money is from the federal and they tell you what to do. And it is not only Alberta that is affected. It's everybody else that's affected. The problem that we have is we need people with the courage to make the changes. And how are we going to do this? is going to be extremely difficult. I'm going to propose having something like a healthcare savings account. And we can talk about this in, in greater detail on how we go a bit later. We need a complete review of the curriculum in the education system in Alberta. The one problem I have is I saw recently a an editorial by the Calgary Herald who was uh, reporting on what's happening in, in, in Alberta about the curriculum review. And the Herald said they have 300 competent people looking at it. They are professionals. I don't doubt whatsoever that there are great thinking educators out there. The problem I have is they are all unionized and they are being pushed one direction and another. So our curriculum in certain cases are becoming totally, totally out of sync with what is required in the working place. I believe in certain circumstances that education is no longer what it used to be, but is becoming indoctrination. And it's very scary because that's where progressivism is getting all its, its fuel. We help to diversify the economy through tax incentives, not corporate subsidies. So there's the rub. We think that there's going to be a panacea when we elect a government under the United Conservative Party. I don't care who is in charge or whatever. The question that I have is, what is the UCP going to do to make us better? Who has 
the guts, the intestinal fortitude to make the changes necessary for Alberta to regain its place as a strong fiscal uh, province. A strong fiscal conservative government who will focus on removing burdensome regulations. A focus on real social issues. To me, social issues are not gay pride or whatever. That's my question. When did it become a prerequisite for a politician to attend the parade of whatever denomination or whatever name to be elected? We have a society that have allowed this to happen. I have a lot of gay friends. I have a tennis partner who's gay. I have a friend of mine who is an artist, a well-known artist, and I have his painting in my place. Another friend who is a, a potter, uh, he does pottery, raku pottery, I have his works in my house. It doesn't mean that I'm against gays. I don't attend a, a pride parade because that's not my scene. The question, once again, is when did it become a prerequisite for a politician to be elected if he doesn't attend a certain parade? And that's a big question. Political correctness is beginning to influence the thinking of our politician in such a way that it is now becoming a cultural issue. And it also affects the ideology, which also affects the way that they will look at our economy and our fiscal management. So to me, social issues are health care, education, safety, and security. These are social issues. So what do we need? is a return to true conservative principles of smaller government and free market economy. And I hope that's what we are going to discuss, having some ideas, and we'll put it on the table as we go along today. Well, thank you. Thank you, I think you really touched on that, and we can talk more about that as the, as the day unfolds. Yeah. One of the things John says on his website is, you can't change the politics until you change the culture. So what you're talking about is changing the culture. I mean, if you want to get all these things done, changing the size of government and getting better performance government, we've got to look at the delivery of services. Because to me, one of the problems we have is it's not the service, it's how we deliver it. And who delivers it? For, for us to look at the size of government, I believe that one way to do that is to enforce a policy of zero-based budgeting. Now, whether you do it every year or you do it every three years is a matter of conjecture, whether you do it. But what is zero-based budgeting is that you take a view that you start the business that you're in or your department services from zero, as if you started all over again. So with what is happening today with technology and so on and so forth? There are a lot of things that are still being pushed paper all over the place that you need five or six people doing it. You don't examine the process of doing things. We focus too much on process, and that's where the problem is, as opposed to outcomes. So if we do zero-based budgeting and we say, this is the outcome we want to have at the end of the day, what do we need? to achieve this particular point. So you look at the business, how many people we are going to do, so you start activity-based costing, you start looking at how many people you need, what is the service I'm going to do, and how much it's going to cost me. So when you start looking at your, your department by department by doing this, you start looking at how many people we need, what resources we need, how much is going to cost us. If there are any efficiencies, you remove it from the budget immediately. Because what we are doing mostly nowadays in budgets, we do budgets, you know, we say, okay, it's a hundred billion. Uh, inflation is going to be 2%, so there's 2%. Growth in population is going to be 3%, so there's another three. But what we haven't looked at is the services that we are delivering. Are we going to change it? 
Do we have better technology to, ch to change it? We don't do that. We just inflate the budget year after year after year. And the pushback you normally get is, it's, it's, it's very funny. Because the pushback that I've had every single time is, but it costs money to do those reviews. Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to say to you. You are the guys who are always complaining that you are able to manage money best, and then you say to me, oh, it costs too much money to do it. To reduce, if we are going to reduce your budget, and you spend that little bit of money to make a bigger impact, why not do it? That's not the point, really. What they are saying to you is, we do not want to cut back on what we have today. So what happens is the bureaucracy just keeps growing and growing and growing at the inflation rate plus the population growth. So if you look at zero-based budgeting and you go straight back at the bottom and you say, what am I doing? How am I going to deliver that service? Do I have new technology to be able to do it more efficiently? and where my efficiencies are. And that's your, your start point for your budget. And that's what zero-based budgeting is. The city of Calgary started zero-based reviews, which is a joke. Because they do it, they mess around with e each other, and they start putting efficiencies. Then what they do with the efficiencies is very interesting. They put it into what is known as the sustainability fund. So that sustainability fund now is outside of your budget. So it is in a reserve that can now be used by politicians to do their little things. So they, they have money in the reserve, so today they will take it out and say, we are going to do this. In fact, the latest one is, were you at City Hall today or? No? Who, no, who was Colin, uh, Colin Craig? Oh, he's still there. there. Well, he's still going to be there because uh, I've, I've had this done to me. That's why I don't go to council anymore. Because uh, if they see me, they put my name last on the list. It's 8 o'clock that I'm there. So I've been there since 9 o'clock. So what happens is they now are proposing a $10 million from the reserve to be given as uh, a grant to new businesses. And you know who the, the businesses are? <coughs> they are going to put it to the public. But departments in the city are also allowed to apply for those grants. So therefore, if it has gone from your budget efficiencies into a reserve, which is now not controllable under the budgetary control, you give it to your department, that means there's no accountability anymore. There's no transfer. Transfer, transparency at all. So with zero-based budgeting, you take it out, you get the efficiency, and my point of view is when you find those efficiencies, the money should be returned immediately to the taxpayer as a reduction in your tax base. So I want to see if I understand this. The, the way, for instance, the Alberta Health budget is done now, right. they take what they got last year, yes. and put an increase for inflation, an increase for population growth, and then any program they happen to have, have altered. Yep. But under zero-based budgeting, would they say, you get $21 billion, figure out what's the best way to spend it? Or would they no. say, this is you need to give this health care? No, you get $0. You get zero dollars, you figure out what you need to deliver health care. Exactly. Okay. Under the new uh, year, so you look at efficiencies, you look at new uh, technology that you can use to employ to deliver the services, and you focus on outcomes. So you basically build, rebuild what you're you doing. You rebuild it. Yeah, you start at zero base. So you rebuild it. Then you have to justify every item you're going to spend it on. Like, the, like this last year, you know, wages was $100 million. Well, you got to show, well, yeah, we've got this many people. It's going to be 100 Yeah, because if you assume, well, we're going to have the same people doing the same things, you very rapidly rebuild the exactly. budget. Exactly. But if you start from zero, rethinking what you're doing yeah. and then putting price tags on each bit, then. Exactly. I mean, you know, if we want, if we want good performance government, we've got to start doing this as one of the tools we can use. Of course, you know, Peter has told you, I mean, there are so many other tools that we can use, but it's one of the tools that we should be looking at very seriously. Because 
without transparency, there's no accountability. And one way to get some transparency is to start looking at yourself. And when you look at yourself, you say, what am I here for? What is the reason that my department exists? What services am I supposed to deliver? What are the outcomes I want to get? Especially in healthcare. Yes. It's so difficult nowadays to measure the outcomes. Every time I see a report for either the frontier or the public policy, it's about, oh, the Fraser Institute, for instance, will tell you, oh, it's now five years to get a hip replacement. Last year, you know, the last study that we did was perhaps three years. We continue to have a lengthier and lengthier time, waiting time, in certain areas of, of healthcare delivery today. But if you go to zero base, you start asking yourself, what outcomes do I want? And you start budgeting yourself accordingly. It's a good method, method to have transparency and accountability. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it, like it's amazing that this cost thing, like how, you know, but in any event, uh, like it, at, 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 at any point in time, like I, w I wonder if anybody would sit down and say, like out of these 18 departments, like could we get rid of three of them? Like could we just get rid of, just plain get rid of three of them? Like You're I- talking zero-based departments? Yeah, zero-based <laughs> yeah. departments. That's well, what well, it would be. Yes. Well, you yeah. see, you start doing your restructuring at the same but, time. Yeah. Because, but, you know, you start asking yourself, what is the purpose of this department anymore? None. But, like our guy was the minister of tours, and Mr. Starkey, you know, as a friend we like him, but as a you know politician we didn't. But nevertheless, like I mean, do we really need a department of tourism in Alberta anymore? Like I mean, we've all got our let let all the businesses, uh, you know, I don't know. Anyway, thank you very much.